Welcome, everyone. Uh, this is an interview that Sharon Salzberg has kindly agreed to have with us. And uh, part of why we wanted to have it was just um, coming to the U.S. three years ago. We feel we stepped into a Buddhist um, community and culture, which was largely seeded and cultivated by the first wave of, you know, Buddhist insight teachers of which Sharon was instrumental and a key part of. So we really want to express our gratitude, uh, first and foremost, for your role in spreading the Dhamma in the West. Sharon, thank you so much. Well, thank you. So I'll begin with a brief intro. Sharon Salzberg is a meditation pioneer, world-renowned teacher, and New York Times bestselling author. She's among the first to bring mindfulness and loving-kindness meditation to mainstream American culture 50 years ago, inspiring generations of meditation teachers and wellness influencers. A co-founder of the Insight Meditation Society in Barrie, Massachusetts, Sharon is the author of 13 books, including the New York Times bestseller, Real Happiness, now in its second edition, and her seminal work, Loving Kindness. In 2023, Sharon released two new books, Real Life, The Journey from Isolation to Openness and Freedom, and Finding Your Way, Meditations, Thoughts, and Wisdom for Living an Authentic Life. Sharon's popular podcast, The Meta Hour, has amassed 7 million downloads and features interviews with thought leaders from the mindfulness movement and beyond. And uh, we want to thank Steve Wilhelm for connecting us with Sharon. So Sharon, once again, just we really appreciate you taking the time. Oh, it's it's great to see you, to meet you, and and to be with all your listeners. Uh, Ajahn Kovilo, please. Yeah, so Sharon, in one of your books, uh, the two thousand three Faith: Trusting Your Own Deepest Experience, uh, you talk a bit about your life. You give a bit of your your biography, and um, could you just tell us more about that? Um, what was your early life like, and what led you to have faith and how, what's your understanding of faith this sadha that's a big question <laughs> or a succession of questions well as you know very well uh, within the buddhist tradition the word faith is is really different than we commonly understand it or i think we understand it here in the west and um you know it doesn't at all mean a commodity that you either have enough of or the right kind or you don't and if you don't you're condemned in some way Faith is really an offering of the heart. I think that's the literal meaning of sada, um, to give over one's heart. And that implies knowing we have a heart and actually implies, in my interpretation, knowing that that offering is worth something. You know, that means something when we offer our hearts to something. And I think of it a lot, um, and this will, you know, come back to the first part of your question, as like moving from the periphery right to the center of change and possibility like not knowing what's going to happen but not lying around in the background you know waiting to see you really step forward that's the act of faith and my act of faith was really my decision to go to india i was uh actually i was 17 when i made the decision i was 18 when i left i was uh, by that time i was a junior in college and uh in my sophomore year I had taken an Asian philosophy course, and really, honestly, looking back, as far as I can remember, it was kind of like, oh, that's on Tuesday. That's convenient. You know, let me do that one. And the course totally changed my life. As I often say, the first part was in discussions about the Buddha and the Buddha talking about the suffering that's inherent in life. And a lot of people think that's a kind of depressing message, you know, that's a bummer. But for me, you know, I'd had a very tumultuous, chaotic, traumatic childhood. Uh, my parents separated when I was four. My mother died when I was nine. My father had long disappeared. I went to live with his parents, whom I hardly knew. He came back briefly. Um, when I was 11, had a mental health crisis and went off into the mental health system, which he never left for the whole next remainder of his life. Um, so when I wrote Faith, I actually looked back at my life and I realized by the time I went to college at the age of 16, I'd lived in five different family configurations and everyone had changed because of loss or trauma or, or something terrible happening. And 
So there I was in this Asian philosophy course hearing that suffering is a part of life. It's inevitable. It's natural. And for me, that was a, the biggest me message of inclusion I'd ever heard. It was like for the first time, it's like, I'm not so weird. You know, I'm not so different. I'm not so left out of things. I actually belong. And then I heard in the context of this class, I mean, I kind of vaguely knew anyway, but the, I heard more distinctly there were methods, there were techniques, there were practices called meditation. And if you did them, you could actually be a whole lot happier. So I was going to college in Buffalo, New York. I looked around Buffalo. I did not see it anywhere. So then in the craziest act of faith of my life, you know, I created an independent study project and presented it to the university saying, I want to go to India and study meditation. And they said, okay. So that was really like a massive moving off the sidelines into the center of possibility. I mean, I, I'd grown up in New York City, was going to college in Buffalo. I'd never even been to California, you know, let alone Seattle, you know, let alone India. And suddenly I was like going to India. So uh, it all kind of fits together. So it seems like one thing you're speaking to there is faith. You know, when we speak about faith, we speak about faith in the triple gem of the Buddha, the Dhamma and the Sangha. And it seems like in that uh, particular moment, the faith in the Dhamma is what drew you to make such a leap. And yet I know in uh, subsequent years, you studied with Deepa Ma, with Anagarika Munindra, with Sayada Upandita, with, um, and other Asian masters. And so speaking to faith in the Sangha um, and that particular flavor of Sada, would you have anything to share about the moments which really turned your heart towards some of those teachers? Um, and we love stories. So if there's any ones that come to mind with, with any of them, with Deepa Ma or otherwise, then we'll be interested. But yes. Well, I, uh, all of my teachers have been Asian. I, I have never had a Western teacher to this date. We'll see what happens, you know, uh, there's still time, I suppose. But um, in, I've heard that in the Zen tradition, there's a kind of ethos that the goal of every Zen master is to have a student who surpasses them. And it's not that I've ever surpassed any of my teachers by any means, but I felt instinctively, immediately with each one of them, I could trust their motivation. You know, that they were not, we were not in this dynamic in the service of their ego or their self-satisfaction. It was all about me and my own potential. And, and you know, clearly many times a teacher will see something in the student the student does not see in themselves. And that's uh, a real in inspiration and encouragement to move forward, to keep going. So my, um, <clears throat> you know, kind of classic Deepama story is the time um, when she was a student of Manindra's uh, in Burma. Uh, and I met her when she visited him in India. And um, she was a, a tremendously loving presence. I, somebody wrote a book about her, uh, subsequently called Deepa Man. I always felt a little sorry for the author because there were some teachers, Meninger would be one example, uh, who would have the ability to just kind of offer like this pithy saying and your whole mind would turn around, you know, one sentence or two sentences. And it was like, oh, um, you know, the for example, Meninja said something to me like, um, you know, why are you ashamed of all these thoughts coming up in your mind? Did you invite them? Did you like, you know, or the Buddha's enlightenment solved the Buddha's problem. Now you solve yours. You know, it just it was like, whoa. But Deepa Mo wasn't like that. You know, for me, it was really her presence, her, her incredible loving energy. Um, and so I wondered about that author, you know, like it's a little hard to convey that somehow. But my main uh, story of her tremendous blessing was um, years after I'd met her, this is 1974, I'd gone to India in 1970. 
I began meditation in January of 1971. I came back briefly to finish school, and then I went back to India and was actually leaving in 1974 for what I was completely convinced was going to be a very brief visit back to the States before I went back to India forever for the rest of my life, because that's where I was happiest and I was learning and it was so exciting. So I went to Calcutta where Deepama lived to get her blessing for my very brief visit back to the United States. And um, she lived in what we would call a tenement, just like a room up four flights of really dank and horrible stairs. And, and, uh, I went to see her and told her I was leaving, and she said to me, um, well, Joseph Goldstein, whom I'd met in India, had already come back maybe six months before then. She said to me, when you go back to America, you'll be teaching with Joseph. And I said, no, I won't. And she said, yes, you will. And I said, no, I won't. I'm coming right back. And the thought of my being able to teach the Dhamma was ridiculous. You know, it was, it was absurd. And she kept saying, yes, you will. And I said, no, I won't. And then she said two things that were really very important. One was, you really understand suffering. That's why you should teach. And she was a woman who had suffered so much, the loss of two children, the loss of her husband, and, and had somehow emerged through her practice just this kind of radiant presence of love and compassion. So for her to say that to me was really a kind of startling thing. I also took note she wasn't saying like you're, you know, your practice is so unbelievably deep or your scholarship is so awesome, you know. She said, you really understand suffering. That's why you should teach. And then she said, you can do anything you want to do, but you're thinking you can't do it. It's going to stop you. And I left her room walking down those terrible stairs thinking, no, I won't. <laughs> That's ridiculous. You know, I can't do that. I'm not capable of that. And Came back to the States and went to visit Joseph, who was teaching in Boulder uh, at the opening of Naropa Institute. And he got invited on for the second summer session uh, to teach. And so I stayed on and was like his TA. And then we got invited to teach a retreat. And then we got invited to teach another retreat. And then one day I woke up and I thought, oh, she was right. Look at that. So, I mean, the interest, you know, I, I have a prevailing interest in motivation, like why, what leads us to practice, what, um, especially in these days, you know, in, in my time, you know, as old as I am, um, you really had to make effort to find a teacher, to find a practical set of guide, guidances, you know, that wasn't just abstract or, or theoretical. and. These days, it's it's much easier, you know, but so many people are still motivated by personal suffering or who wish to ease suffering in the world. It's just kind of interesting. Sharon, you mentioned that pretty much all of your teachers have been Asian, and yeah. Ajahn Nisibo mentioned some of them, in addition to the, the ones who Ajahn Nisibo mentioned. I mean, Goenka Ji, who is the way that I got doing his Vipassana retreats, is how I got into uh, Buddhism and how many monastics these days and just many people in general come to Buddhism and also Upandita, Upandita. Mm -hmm. but then also among your influences are the Dalai Lama, Kalu Rinpoche, Sony Rinpoche, Toku Urgu Rinpoche, these Tibetan masters, Dzogchen mm -hmm. masters. And I'm curious, I mean, how was there any, and then going and, you know, staying at Naropa, um, was there any kind of disconnect or was it a pretty natural um, I don't know about shift, but a pretty natural being able to absorb coming from a, a Theravada, heavily Theravada um, influenced practice, especially with mm -hmm. Goenka and Ubakin, who are, or uh, Upandita, who are so yeah. um, Theravada orthodoxy. Yeah. How did you, how did your heart open up to um, Tibetan practice or other styles of Buddhist practice? Was Goenka was my first teacher, you know, so, I mean, that was really important. And and it was, I think, very important for me, you know, that his courses were very structured. Um, you know, you knew when you were kind of doing the practice and when you weren't. Um, 
and I met Menindra, who was also living in Bodh Gaya, which is where my first retreat was, even before I, I met Goenka, before his retreat began. And it was funny because I, I overheard somebody say to Menindra, um, you know, just a student that was around, and uh, I feel like going into town, which was a little distance from the, the Burmese Vihara, we were all staying and waiting for the retreat to start. So I feel like going into town and, and getting some chai. And town was just this very tiny little village in those days. And Manindra said, oh, go, go, just go mindfully. And I thought, I don't know what that means. And then Goenka came by and he locked the gates. You know, so it was like, you were not leaving the premises during the, the course, you know, the retreat. And, and I needed that. I needed, you know, very intense structure and boundaries and um, and then as time went on, uh, I grew closer to Menindra, and he was uh, such a free spirit. And that was very important for me, you know, to absorb the understanding, like, yeah, you can go to town, but go mindfully. You know, don't be so afraid. Because uh, I was a very frightened person. And uh, and then Deepa Ma through Menindra, and then... Um, Early on in there, somebody showed me a photo of Kala Rinpoche, uh, previous Kala Rinpoche, not the current one. And, and he had such a sort of dramatic and austere face. I thought, oh, I want to go meet him. So I went to the Darjeeling area of India. You had to leave by guy anyway. It was so hot. And, uh, and studied with him. And mostly I was confused, you know, should I do this practice? Should I do that practice? And, uh, and so, in all honesty, I didn't really do any practice because every time I'd sit down to meditate, I think, should I do this? Should I do that? Which one's faster? Which one's better? You know, well, those people seem more enlightened than these people, but then I know these people better. If I knew those people as well as I knew these people, maybe they wouldn't seem so enlightened. Should I do this? Should I do that? Should I do this? Should I do that? And I was doing nothing. So at one point, I said to myself, just do something. Just do a practice. It doesn't have to be a lifetime commitment. Um, and I, I kind of chose Vipassana or Insight Meditation because it seems simpler. But I love the teachings in the context of the Tibetan tradition. And so I stayed. And then I went back to Bodh Gaya and, and really pursued the, the Theravadan uh, expressions of the teaching for a very long time. And it was more like 1991. Uh, I had friends who were doing Zogchen practice, which seemed, in my mind, um, from the outside, quite similar to experiences I'd had doing Vipassana practice, but not uh, expressed so much in, you know, I'm far from a scholar for one thing, but not expressed so much in in the Theravada literature. And so I was drawn to kind of learn, like, what's that about? And so I did develop very strong relationships with Nosha Ken Rinpoche and to Gorgon Rinpoche, who's Sonny Rinpoche's father, and, and then Sonny Rinpoche um, more currently. And um, so it's really sort of within that context. I never felt I was leaving behind sort of the, the richness. And, and also my teaching is, is within the context of the Theravada tradition and those methods and those those approaches. Um, if anything, you know, the Thai forest tradition within the Theravada may be closest to the Dzogchen expression of of the, the Dharma. And so So Sharon, the um you speak about sort of your root in the Theravada. You've also been one of the key figures in bridging between that root and the much wider audience that have, you know, begun to trickle and percolate into the sort of Buddhist worldview. And I think necessarily, you know, really emphasize teachings which are quite um, accessible, such as loving kindness, such as metta. And yet you, you know, have at the core of your understanding these um, deep insights into the suffering of samsara into the need for structure and discipline, into the root texts and the need for a teacher. Um, so I find there's this fascinating fissure line between like a well-intentioned progressive spiritual practitioner and 
the core Theravada. And it's, it's really interesting to see kind of teachings, which like, when do you push beyond, you know, into that kind of more uh, difficult territory? And when do you apply discipline? And when do you speak to rebirth or all these other things, you know, and, and I'm curious how you've navigated that line in your own, in your own teaching. I feel like I'm very strongly influenced by my earliest teachers, Goenka and Manindra, and even Deepama, you know, to a different extent, but because she was sort of a living embodiment of bringing the Dhamma into your life, you know. But Goenka was my first teacher and my first, uh, because his format was intensive 10 day retreats, my first retreat began January 7th, 1971 in Bodh Gaya, India, and, and the first night of my first retreat, Goenka said, the Buddha did not teach Buddhism, the Buddha taught a way of life. So these methods are available, they're open to anybody, you don't have to become a Buddhist, you don't have to swear off your other faith, you know, if you have one in India, many people did have one. Um, and so that was that was my first night, you know, of exposure, and so that became like a foundational understanding for me, which I brought right into kind of current analysis of, you know, what about secular mindfulness and what about this? And I always come back to the Buddha did not teach Buddhism. The Buddha taught a way of life. Um, and then Manindra, who was, you know, very much this kind of free spirit and and, you know, he would always say, like, you know, we were living in India, which was like a spiritual supermarket. And there'd be some kind of like wacko swami somewhere claiming whatever. And somebody would say to him, I feel like going, you know, and, and checking them out. And he would always say, go. You should go. He said, the, the Dhamma doesn't suffer from comparison. You know, just go. And, uh, so there, there were very strong influences on me, you know, as I look at this world. And um, I've met many a person who has approached mindfulness, for example, as a purely secular practice. And uh, because of the sincerity of their own effort, often because of their personal suffering. I mean, John Kabat-Zinn started it not too far from here in Barry in Worcester, the UMass Medical Center. And I used to visit once a week. I thought, what's he up to? You know, what's going on there? And every single one of his earliest people uh, had been referred by the physicians who felt that they just couldn't help them anymore. They didn't know what to do. And there seemed to be a stress component in their illness. And I used to, you know, so every week I went and I witnessed their changes. People who'd had migraines for 25 years were suffering a lot less. People who had amputations. I mean, it was just like this enormous field of suffering, and they were getting a lot better because they were applying the techniques sometimes more with more intensity than someone in a more luxurious position, you know, it just takes it more casually as a hobby or something like that. Uh, you know, so I have enormous respect for um, the potential of those practices, which are very accessible. But you're also bringing up something which I was kind of referring to vaguely a little bit earlier, which is that I'm very intrigued by the notion of motivation and you know, when I went to India, I went halfway around the world as an 18-year-old and a terrified 18-year-old at that because I had to in order to actually learn some methods and not just, you know, there were almost no books either, but, you know, not just read about it. I had to really learn. I had to really do that. And so, too, the wave of people, you know, who were there with me. Um, and and so it took tremendous motivation because the the direct teachings were very inaccessible and now they're not inaccessible. Now they're everywhere. So what does it mean, you know? And I'm just so curious about 
about that. Some people are motivated very strongly. Other people um, have a, a really passionate curiosity about life. They're not suffering so much. Um, and yet it's possible certainly to undertake all of this in a most casual way, you know, and I don't know what happens then. Yeah, I, I appreciate the way that you write. Um, you write very carefully. Um, and what you just said now, the Buddha didn't teach Buddhism. He taught a way of life. And I certainly agree with that. What, what do you say to people who like, are not secular, secularly oriented and actually are perfectly fine with religiosity and symbols of religion? And um, yeah, how do you encourage the, the motivation of people who uh, do find beauty and joy and energy in, yeah, in bowing or in you know, Buddhist statues and all these things? Yeah, I think it's wonderful. You know, many people, I just uh, recorded part of a, a program that'll be up on IMS online about the art at IMS. And so talked some about the history. So we, Joseph, Jack, Jack Cornfield, Joseph Goldstein and I, and some friends who were really responsible, you know, for opening up the retreat center. We opened it up in 1976. We moved in on Valentine's Day of 1976, and it had been a Catholic novitiate. So uh, for those of you who are familiar with that, that means a certain kind of decor, you know, linoleum and uh, things like that. So um, we we walked into the building. We turned the chapel into a meditation hall, got rid of all the pews and stuff. and and then. One of the discussions we had, because we had no models, like what does it look like here? Uh, one of the model, one of the discussions we had was, I think, very kind of charmingly phrased: "Should there be Buddhas in public places?" Because each of us, Jack with Ajahn Chah, Joseph and I with Segoenka and Menindra, had that strong influence. The Buddha did not teach Buddhism. You know, he taught a way of life. And yet, there's a tradition, there's a history, there's a question of respect in a culture, the American culture, that doesn't often honor respect, you know, as a quality. And, and there's the very essential matter of we didn't make it up. You know, like years later, after we moved into the center, I was teaching a loving kindness weekend somewhere, and someone came to me and said, the stuff is so fantastic. When did you make it up? And I said, you're really lucky. I didn't make anything up, you know? And so we didn't want that impression either. And we went back and forth and back and forth. What should we do? I mean, the staff members had Buddhas in their bedrooms. That's why it was phrased, do you want Buddhas in public places? You know, some people are very offended by that. Some people are really enriched by that. You know, what do you do? What do you do? And finally, uh, it turned out that when Jack had been, after he was a monk, or, when he was, or before he was a monk, when he was in the Peace Corps, also in Thailand, he'd bought a number of Buddha statues, which were all stored in his mother's attic. And one day this U-Haul arrived with all these Buddhas from Jack's mother's attic. And so we said, okay, I guess we're going to have Buddhas in public places. So we had Buddhas, you know, as you know, we have them in the meditation hall, we have them in various places. And we try to explain them, you know, like when you see a Buddha statue, you are seeing something essentially about your own potential. And when you bow to that statue, it's almost like a transparency. We see our own potential in the Buddha. And it's not just me and the Buddha. It's all beings on that level of the potential for freedom and for enlightenment. And that's what we are bowing to. And you know, without explanation, it's a little dicey, but uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful ritual. We have chanting, uh, you know, as well, which some people really enjoy. Um, we do the refuges and precepts in the beginning of the retreat, but I do find it all warrants some explanation. Because the other thing that happens, if people don't understand, then they feel left out. You know, and they, they really question whether they belong. And, and that, I think, is unfortunate. 
Thank you, Sharon. A U-Haul full of Buddhas. I U-Haul really like full that. of Buddhas. <laughs> um, in terms of motivation, um, that of suffering, and it seems based on your family history and how you grew up, you've experienced a level of that, which, you know, I, I think a, a decent proportion of the population has, but but I have not. And kind of this level of pretty profound, deep familial trauma, the fear that emerges from that, perhaps elements of, I can't speak exactly to experience, but I imagine elements of shame or other things. Um, how do you advise people who have that level of sankhara and trauma in them and grow up with that? How do they practice with, you know, if they're not ready to to go there yet? Or how do you advise people to work with, with trauma from childhood? Or well, I think after. I think there, are, yeah, I think there are a couple of components that are really important. It could be from childhood, you know, it could be from anything really, you know. Uh, people come with all kinds of different life experiences, you know, past and current. And um, I think one is best served by a teacher who has some flexibility in approach and even you know uh old style very formal teachers like Saida Upandita who you brought up who is a monk from Burma um you know he came here in 1984 and taught a three-month retreat which I and Joseph and many of our friends sat under his guidance and he didn't have to be a really fierce, intense, demanding teacher. And we had a wonderful connection, but he was really intense, you know. And um, and one day in the meditation hall, somebody asked him, how long should I pay attention to physical pain before I move my attention to something that's easier to be with, like listening to sound or something more comfortable in your body or whatever? And that was a very kind of potent question because we use physical pain as a model for emotional pain. So how long should I be with a painful experience before I move my attention to something that's easier to be with? And and I thought, given Saito Pandita's personality, he was going to say you should be with the pain till you fall over. I honestly did. And to my amazement, he said, don't be with it for very long. He said, be with the pain, move your attention to something that's easier to be with. Then maybe go back to the pain then move your attention away again. He said, it's not wrong to be with the pain and be with the pain and be with the pain, but you'll likely get exhausted. So why not build in balance all along the way? Because the idea is not that, you, that suff- suffering is not the point. You know, suffering is not redemption, but relating differently to the suffering is freedom. You know, instead of being defined by it, instead of being terrified of it, instead of being ashamed of it, as you said, you know, to have a, a stance of mindfulness, balance, loving kindness, compassion, and so on is very possible for us. And that's where freedom is, you know, but it's not just to sit in there and suffer and suffer and suffer and suffer. And I was sitting there in the hall, I, th- I mean, you could have knocked me over with a feather. I was so shocked that he said that. But I think that's the kind of approach of flexibility one really needs. Eyes open or closed. Maybe it's not that smart, you know, if you're experiencing traumatic memory to sit there with your eyes closed. Things like that. And then the other thing which you you mentioned earlier is the community, you know, is not to feel so alone. It's to understand that, you know, we don't all suffer in the same way or the same degree, but we are all vulnerable. We really are, and so we can have uh, much less of a sense of isolation when we do have a strong sense of community and practice, and that I think is very helpful. A related question, just to tag onto that, is is forgiveness, because I imagine that goes along with this constellation quite a lot. How do how do people forgive um, when it's one of those grudges that just will not die? How do you help people through that? Could you repeat just the part of your question? Because I was coughing. No, no worries. Sorry. Um, 
a related question um, is how you advise people to forgive um, those difficulties or traumas that and people that they just can't let go of. Like, how do you walk people through those really deep um, grudges is almost too little of a word, but how do you teach forgiveness for people like mm -hmm. that? Um, I think there are two levels of that. I think one is not to expect too much of oneself. Um, I once wrote a book, um, Real Love, I think it was, and uh, turned it in to the publisher, turned in the manuscript to the publisher, who was a friend. And uh, when he wrote back with his feedback, he said, I really liked the book. And part I liked the best was this quotation you have of Roshi Joan Halifax, who's a Zen teacher and a friend of mine where she said something like, like um, don't try to force yourself to think of the traumas of your life as a gift. They're givens. And I thought, well, that's funny. The part of my book he liked the most, I didn't even write, you know, Roshi Joan wrote. Um, and, but I actually liked it the best too, because sometimes we do have this pretentious idea that we have to be grateful. You know, we have to forgive. And I don't think it's true. We do have to understand they're givens. This happened. You know, let me integrate this experience into my life in, in some reasonable way. Sometimes people do grow to feel grateful or whatever, and that's fine. That's wonderful. But you shouldn't force yourself, you know. Um, when I talk about forgiveness, it's a complicated thing because we use the word so differently. Another friend of mine, a colleague, Sylvia Borstein, once said, forgiveness is not amnesia. You know, we tend to think it means wiping the slate clean and what happened didn't matter. And maybe it mattered a lot, you know, and still does. But we do really explore, like, what does it mean not to be so burdened? by someone else's actions, not to sort of have given over some of your life force to what someone else has done, to be defined by it in a way, because it hurts so much and it makes our lives so much smaller, our own lives so much smaller. As one friend of mine who describes himself as, um, people, when I say a friend of mine, they all say these things publicly, so I'm not just being a nasty kind of friend, but you know, he 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 describes himself as a kind of obsessive type where somebody will have hurt him, or maybe not even hurt him, but behave badly in his eyes on the world stage, and he'll obsess about it, he'll go over it and 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 over. And he emerged from a period like that, and he said to me, I think it's an AA statement actually. He said, "I let him live rent free in my brain for too long." You know, so that's what we mean by forgiveness. We want release from that internal kind of obsession with what someone else has done. I also talk a lot about how I don't think that means a mandate for a certain kind of behavior. You know, this comes up a lot with teaching loving kindness. People say, if I were to develop a more loving heart, does that mean I have to give them more money? I have to let them move back in. I have to let them keep hurting me. I have to pretend it didn't matter. Um, one person said to me once, does it mean I have to go visit them in jail, even though the reason they are in jail is that they abused me so badly when I was a child? And my response is, no, I don't think it means any of that. It means a freedom of the heart. And then discernment and wisdom and kind of a broader kind of mindfulness can all figure into our decision about whether we say yes or we say no. Whether we are fierce or gentle, whatever it is, it doesn't have to be motivated by hatred or fear. And, and that's a crucial distinction, I think, for us to have. Sharon, this, this past week, I've done a little bit of a deep dive into your different, um, yeah, your podcast and uh, some of your books. I reread uh, Loving Kindness, and 
Um, I'm curious um, how you as a teacher um, manage or avoid like soft peddling renunciation, you know, or, and avoiding like the audience capture. You are teaching a largely, um, yeah, a lay audience, people who aren't celibate monastics. And I'm curious, I mean, but, you know, renunciation is part of the, um, part of the Buddhist path. And so how to teach real love in a way which avoids, it could be an easy confusion with um, sexual, um, yeah, sexual attraction. And um, yeah, so to be able to um, not forget, you know, the, the middle way that avoids the aspect of sensual pleasure, which is low course, vulgar, ignoble, and unprofitable, and that other uh, aspect of um, yeah, self-torture, which is dukkha and unprofitable and ignoble as well. Well, because I do largely teach lay people, you know, it's a lot centers around the precepts, around ethics, around morality, around simplicity, and uh, very much not only based on compassion for others, but on compassion for oneself, because the the suffering of um, guilt, suffering of paranoia, like what if they find out, you know, what I've done, just the suffering of complexity, you know, and uh, even when it's not, you know, uh, kind of flagrant moral violation, I think it always helps to look at the consequences in our own experience, in our own minds, and and to see that, you know, I, I tell a story, um, which only, it might not make sense unless you've ever lived in New York and been subject to real estate there, but um, a friend told me a story about um, uh, many buildings in the area he wanted to live in in New York City um, are co-ops, they're cooperatives, and that means that there's a co-op board that decides how long an owner can rent out their unit for. So it might just be a year, you know, that if you want to rent that apartment, you might just have it for a year. It might be two years, but they decide, not the owner. And uh, he got an offer of an apartment, which was in exactly the area he wanted to be in, exactly the building he wanted to be in. Uh, much more reasonable rent, big, beautiful apartment. And he was about to take it. And then he had the thought, I wonder if this is actually a legal rental or because sometimes the owners try to slide by the, the rules, you know, and they, and they uh, do it undercover. You know, they say, if you meet someone in the elevator, say you're my cousin or something, you know, don't tell them you're renting the apartment. And, uh, and so he, he kind of tried to ask the owner, you know, like, is this, because she was saying things like, well, if something breaks, don't go to anybody in the building office. You know, you can go to one doorman only, and this is the doorman. And, uh, you know, so he started to get really uneasy. And then he realized, you know, it was not a legal rental, that every single time he walked into that lobby, he was going to be thinking, what if they find out, you know? And, not being being able to meet the eye of any doorman except the one who seemed to be on the take somehow, you know, or whatever. And he finally realized, I can't live that way. You know, keeping a secret and having this complexity, and it's not worth it, even though it seems like the perfect apartment. So he then went and said um, he rejected the apartment, and he was talking to some of his friends, and they said, are you crazy? Everyone in New York lives that way. You know, because the rules are so weird. Like, you know, why can't the owner, like, decide who's going to live in their apartment? You know, so it's not like, that's what I mean by, you know, this. it's not a flagrant moral um, harm, you know. It's not like a God-given or, you know, entrenched tradition. It's just somebody made up these rules. But do you really want to live that way? In, in this sort of weird variance from the truth? and. And I think it's it's essential in this world, you know, that we really look at those things. 
wheelchair and speaking about the goals of practice um, in kind of the higher aims which we can set our sights on with the experience of stream entry um, or the kind of first encounter with the, uh, the deathless. Um, I'm curious, you know, is this something you have seen lay practitioners encounter at times and how do you um, in such a case kind of measure a, or how do you uh, judge an experience of that state as authentic or, or not? And I know that kind of flirts with a realm that we tiptoe around a lot, but I am curious about um, if it's something that you have navigated in terms of uh, working with people who've encountered that or judging it as authentic or, or inauthentic. Well, I try not to judge, you know, because my own teachers would not judge. And that is one of the difficulties I have with um, teaching broadly about the concept, you know. And people think that sometimes we don't teach it so much because we don't want people to get all tied up in knots about, do I have it? Do I not have it? How close am I? Where, you know, is it close? Is it far? I'm not doing well. I'm not, you know. And that's true, but there's also an element of, you know, like in Burma, my teachers would never say, you know, oh, that's it, you know, congratulations. It was always, are you satisfied with your practice or some kind of coy statement like that? Or I think in some other place they play you a certain tape or something, you know, so um, because you know, there didn't seem to be a kind of uniform understanding, you know, so some teachers would say, well, if your life changes, you know, if you, if you have kind of a, an unbreakable understanding of selflessness, you know, like a kind of understanding from which there's no turning back, not, um, that you live it perfectly every moment, but there's no doubt in your mind, you know, if someone put you up against the wall, you wouldn't say, oh, maybe there is a self, you know, or it's permanent or whatever. Um, so it was always left up to the person in some way to uh, have, I've also seen people kind of over identify with the notion and then it becomes a new identity, which is also weird, you know, given what it's about, you know. Uh, so I don't, you know, I think people, I've certainly seen people have awesome experiences from which my sense is there's probably no turning back. But I think it's up to them to, to ascertain or if they want to, you know. Yeah. On this, on this level about of belief, whether it's belief in uh, awakening, that that's possible. Um, yeah, also on the, the topic of rebirth, something which is similarly a belief which people can either take on or not, or consciously take on, unconsciously take on, um, semi-consciously take on. Um, but you, in a, I think it was a recent podcast, um, you were saying, yeah, there's definitely a psychological aspect of rebirth but you say intuitively for yourself, you feel that rebirth is very likely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you have a sense that letting go of this body isn't necessarily the end of the show. Um, but how this happens is a mystery. Um, how, do you, how do you hold talking about these kind of beliefs? Because for some people, you even mention your own beliefs that you, one believes in rebirth or one believes in, yeah, that one can really put an end to fully to greed, anger, and delusion. Um, some people just have, I think you, you pointed to this in one of your, uh, in your recent response, but some people just totally shirk back from that. And you mentioned that it all go in that direction. People just shut down. It's like, okay, this is religion. Don't want it. Um, so how, yeah, without, yeah, kind of on a similar topic of how to maintain, okay, the Buddha did teach these things but maybe this isn't the right time and place. How do you, how do you navigate that? You know, I, I go back to, I mean, Meninja, uh, I have a Meninja story about that because, 
he certainly would describe um, the cosmology in many realms of, of existence and, you know, rebirth and samsara and so on. And, and I remember there were there was somebody there um, who really did not believe it, you know, and, and was protesting the whole while. And Menindra said, you don't have to believe it. He said, it's true, but you don't have to believe it. You know, and because my early teachers were so into have your own experience, put yourself into the practice, explore the nature of the mind and the body and, and their connection and so on. That was what was most important. And um, that was a strong influence on me, you know. So I might talk about it and I might say, as I apparently said, you know, my own personal intuition is that it's true. I also know that when I first started teaching, um, I was so timid a person that, like many people, I would um, hold on to doctrine as though it was my own personal experience and express it, you know, very strongly, like, well, it's this way, you know. And uh, I talk about this in faith, actually getting into an argument with somebody who is from a Mahayana school where there is a different belief about death and rebirth, whereas uh, in the Theravada system, it seems to be the belief that rebirth happens within nine moments after dying, you know, from this body, the consciousness is reborn. In the Tibetan system, there is this period that they talk about of a bardo, an intermediate state, lasting up to 49 days before rebirth takes place and I got into this argument with this person and and neither of us actually knew, you know, but we were each holding on to different expressions of doctrine. And it was only later I, I thought, well, we were probably two people kind of afraid to die, you know, and, and holding on to this I set of ideas about what it was going to be like, because that was giving us each a sense of security. There just happened to be different ideas about it. And so, you know, all these years later, I'm so unlikely to do that. Um, but sometimes it's, you know, it's it's interesting. And, and I think it's a shame to leave it out totally. You know, if I'm talking about the psychological dimensions of uh, anger, for example, like imagine a whole physicality in life that is sparked largely by that emotion, you know, and, and greed and hungry ghosts and so on. And so uh, it's kind of interesting to bring it in without demanding that people believe it literally. So Sharon, seeing as uh, you're on a video with two monks who definitely believe in these things, um, sure. Maybe we can push you just a little bit. Uh, do you have any stories for us of the supernatural or the absurdly serendipitous? So, you know, either uh, practitioners you've met who've had these experiences um, that have, are particularly inspiring, um, rebirth, etc., memories, devas. Or I know that with most monasteries, uh, the starting up of them, often there's just these moments that happen in, in their growth that seem just very much deva sent, you know, like these really beautiful serendipities. Um, and, you know, if you're in the field of Dhamma, that happens quite often. So just uh, in this, this sort of safe space, uh, I'm just curious if there's any ones that just pop into your mind. We, we love those stories. It's okay. If not. <laughs> That's so funny. Um, I love those stories too. Well, I mean, it, as you know, in uh, some schools of the Theravada, there's a pretty sharp distinction between the path of concentration and the path of insight. And people who pursue um, ardently the path of concentration, I mean, not that they don't come together, but, you know, when it becomes a kind of singular pursuit, um, that's the path, if you have the potential, potential for that depth of concentration to develop what we would call psychic powers. And so they're not considered paranormal. They're just, we can, you know, our view of reality is a little small, you know, and so they're considered kind of normal, but 
enlarged from how we usually see reality. And so the story is that when Deepa Ma, my teacher, went to the monastery in Burma, first Manindra was her translator. She was studying with Mahasi Sayadaw, and she did insight meditation. Um, but he could tell, uh, even as the translator, that she seemed to have a very strong capacity for concentration. So he decided uh, when she had finished that period of practice, he was going to, Manindra himself was going to try to train her in concentration uh, techniques. It's kind of just sheer concentration techniques, not bringing in um, insight into impermanence or any of those other elements. And so he used the texts to figure out how to do it because it was not his own experience. And he trained her. And so they say she had this whole range of psychic powers as a result of that. And she would, you know, go off, go back to hear the Buddha give a discourse or go talk to the devas about something or, uh, walk through walls, you know, and do all these, these kind of things. And I have friends who read this about her and they're furious, you know, and they say, did you ever see her walk through a wall? And I'd say, no, I didn't. Um, how do you know it's true? Well, I mean, I trusted Menindra and also it doesn't matter. You know, we never like, you know, if you think about Deepa Ma, you talk about her, you talk about how loving she was, you know, and how present she was. You don't really talk about, I hear she could, as they say, take a, bake a potato in her hand and make it taste like chocolate. Um, so it was both not all that important, but also, um, even those people could get really angry about it. It was interesting because in terms of psychic dimensions and stories that abound of people who have the capacity to talk to the devas or, you know, uh, tell you about your past, even your past life, um, that seems fine to them. It's the physicality of it, you know, a wall. And I say, well, they say, you know, if materiality is made of earth, air, water, and space, they just enlarge the space. That's how they do it. And then they walk through. It doesn't seem that complicated. But uh, Deepa Ma, for example, um, I think he's talked about this, you know, uh, told Joseph, even, you know, when we met him, her it was some years later and she was not using those powers very much but she told joseph that um he he does talk about this publicly uh he was in a deva realm in his previous life in a heavenly realm a celestial realm with a body of light and a jeweled palace and he enjoyed it very much and you know when he looked back his his mother was very ill when she was pregnant with him and uh he had to be induced early he didn't speak for two years he only cried they thought he couldn't speak actually uh, he just cried and cried because he was suddenly encased in flesh you know instead of a body of light and uh his aesthetic is extremely refined you know he said he doesn't sort of like banana peels you know i mean as he went and knowing him you know i've known him for over 50 years now, I think, gosh, you may have been right, you know, <laughs> like, look at that, you know, and, and she told other people other things that sort of made a lot of sense. Um, but because it's held in a certain light of, of, you know, not the most crucial thing at all, uh, I think we could just sort of appreciate it. Wow. Being able to make dark chocolate potatoes, she would be so popular. I know. Monastery. With six precept people. Oh my gosh. <laughs> um, just to drag us back down to utter uh, mundanity, uh -huh. um, the election is coming up and that's, I think, on many people's minds. And I know you've got a whole election series that you're going into talking with different people and recently had a discussion with Dan Harris on the 10% Happier uh, podcast about how to stay politically engaged without losing your mind. Um, what, so that, yeah, if you could speak to that, how to do that, and this, this is probably getting close to our, our time, but how do you do that? 
So stay politically engaged without losing your mind. But also, how important is it to stay politically engaged? Um, do you think there's a space for non-political engagement? I'm a very strong proponent of something like voting. I don't think you have to... Well, I, I'm a very strong proponent of voting. And I, I remember some years ago, I was visiting a friend, a family, and I said to the teenage son, how old are you? And he said, 17, but I'll turn 18 soon. And I got very excited. I said, well, then you can vote. And there was just like silence at the table. This was breakfast. And then later on, the father said to me, we don't vote. And I said, what do you mean you don't vote? And he said, no, as a family, we just don't vote. We don't find that much um, to engage us. We don't find that much distinction between the candidates. Sometimes they seem just marginal differences. And I said to him, a lot of people live in those margins. You know, and he himself had had a childhood that was really rough. And, you know, and I said, a lot of people live in those margins. It may not matter to you what minimum wage is, for example, but it matters to a lot of people. It's survival. And so I think out of compassion, out of a recognition of interconnection, and then they went on to vote, and they vote all the time. You know, they're very engaged, I'm happy to say. You know, so you don't have to get partisan and horrible and, you know, divisive. and. Um, but I think we need to participate because we do live in an interrelated world. And um, if we feel non-responsive to that fact, then we're living in a variance to how things actually are. And we're abandoning the people who really need us to, um, to take part in it. So at the bare minimum, I think we really need to vote if, you know, we're qualified to vote. And, I also find engagement is, for many people, the antidote to anxiety. And you know, I had this conversation with Dan a long time ago, not if it's not going to be, you know, more widespread political engagement, encouraging others to vote, and, you know, helping others understand the issues as they're presented and whatever, then helping somebody. You know, because the more anxious we are, the more that energy is just like whirling around in us and it needs to express itself in some kind of kindness and service. And so uh, maybe it's political engagement. Maybe it's being kind to your neighbor. I remember in the beginning of the pandemic in New York City, which was anyone who's there knows that's a, that's like a complete sentence right there. You know, like New York City was really in a bad way. and. Uh, I had just gotten there and was teaching, and anxiety in the room was through the roof. And I knew people getting sick. I knew people's parents who were like really sick. And um, I was teaching, uh, and the the facility, their custom was that the speaker sits in the front row of the audience until they're introduced. Then they get up on the stage and they start speaking. So I was sitting in the audience next to this woman who was like jumping out of her skin with anxiety. And uh, she told me, I don't know if I should come. I'm really, you know. And I said, well, you know, there are breathing techniques that help to kind of soothe our nervous system. And you can, you can try that. She wasn't interested. So I said, well, there's this loving kindness practice, you know, which will help you feel connected to broader picture of humanity and all beings and you know she wasn't interested so then i just looked at her and i said is there anyone you can help and she like lit up and she said oh you know i have this elderly neighbor maybe i could go help i can slip a note under her door and offer to buy her groceries or something like that and i thought oh look at that that's so interesting you know, it's like the anxiety is just roiling around in us, but it can find expression and, and kindness, and I think that's really important. Thank you, Sharon. And just we, you've given us a wonderful amount of your time. Uh, before wrapping up, can I just ask for one teaching of the Buddha that's kind of resonated with you through these years? Uh, it can be something simple like Anicca, Anatta, Dukkha, or Noble Truth, or something 
a phrase, um, just one that really has stuck with you in your heart. Uh, hatred will never cease by hatred. Hatred will only cease by love. This is an eternal law. An apt teaching in this prelude to the election. I think that's perfect. So, Sharon, we so appreciate just your um, all you've given the Dhamma in in the West, and um, you know you're giving time to us in the community. Thank you so much for the the life you've lived in line with with Dhamma. Well, thank you. Thank you for all of your service.